Welcome to Christ the Center, Doctrine for Life, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. This is episode number 184, fastly and quickly approaching our 200th episode, which will be out in just a few months. I I can uh, anticipate it already. Let me introduce to you our panel. We have another great episode lined up for the summer, a whole host of of, uh, interviews coming up in the near future. And we're very pleased to welcome back Jim Cassidy, who is teacher of the congregation at Calvary Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Ringo's, New Jersey. Welcome back, Jim. It's great to have you. Camden, it's good to be here. I'm also the pastor of that congregation. What did I say, teacher? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just <laughs> That's okay. No problem. <laughs> he does teach, but we have particular installations and that that is Jeff's installation. Uh, Jim is the pastor. Uh they're both ministers. Man, thanks for correcting me there. I uh, it's a I don't know, some sort of uh, I went on autopilot as you can tell. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh Jim is uh just recently back. Are you are you back? Are you actually in Jersey now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I came back yesterday evening. Uh, The GA broke up early, around 3 o'clock, over a a day ahead of schedule. Unheard of. Um, And it was great. And the schedule was shortened, too. Mm -hmm. And the schedule was shortened. It usually goes Wednesday to Wednesday. It was scheduled for Wednesday to Tuesday, and we finished on Monday. So uh, it was incredible. Unbelievable. So that is the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the general 78th General Assembly, and the 75th anniversary celebration there. For a few years that had two general assemblies. That's how the numbers got out of whack. Uh, but we are going to be speaking about much of OPC history. And we're very pleased to welcome our guest today, which is Dr. Daryl G. Hart, who is a visiting professor at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. He'll be returning there back to Michigan, but we have him for the day here in uh, Glenside, Pennsylvania. Well, uh, thanks for joining us again, Daryl. It's great to have you. Thanks, Cameron. Well, uh, I'm wondering if you'll hit 200 before. Derek Jeter hits 3,000 hits. <laughs> well, he since, got hurt. Since he got hurt, yeah, you, yeah. Might, you might beat him. We, we might get there. It's going to take uh, 16 weeks or so, but uh, hopefully... The race is on. I don't know. I'm not a Yankee fan, so... No, no, no neither am I. Yeah, well, we'll see. I don't want to hope ill will or wish ill will towards somebody, but... Uh, there yeah. were the projections, you know, you being a Cubs fan, that he would get it this weekend in Chicago. Yeah. But he, I don't know if he's going to play now. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. Yeah. Derek Jeter. Mm. Well, we have a wonderful book here ahead of us uh, for discussion. We are going to be speaking about one of the two books that came out for the OPC 75th anniversary. We have Between the Times, which is subtitled The Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Transition, 1945 to 1990. The Committee uh, for the Historian of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church commissioned uh, two books, this one and then a collection of essays called Confident of Better Things. We'll be speaking about several chapters in that volume at a later date with uh, the various authors, and we're hoping to get John Meather on and Danny Olinger as well. Uh, to talk about that book and and the OPC 75th in general. But we're very excited to have Dr. Hart here today to speak about the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in uh, recent years. Um, But before we do that, I would like to mention that Christ the Center and Reform Forum is listener-supported. If you enjoy these programs and you've taken benefit in them, we uh, suggest a policy of value for value. Will you visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate? And there you'll find information and uh, have a link where you will be able to support us financially. We appreciate everyone's prayers and their encouragement through the emails and Uh, tweets that we get uh, on a regular basis, but if you're also able to support us financially, please, please, please visit us online at our website and help us to continue to produce and distribute all of these programs free of charge to those who want to hear them and to see them. Uh, thank you for your support of everything we're doing at Christ the Center and of our organization, Reformed Forum. Well, gentlemen, we uh, just mentioned that the uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church is completed its uh, 78th General Assembly. I was able to be there for a few nights uh, doing some video recording and had a wonderful time speaking with uh, all sorts of people from all over the country. Uh, It's it's wonderful to get together and to convene and talk about the things of the Lord and particularly our ecclesiastical body, uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Jim, would you mind giving just a uh, you know, a brief synopsis. You've you've mentioned some things already, but uh, what was your general takeaway from this year and from the 75th in general? Well, <clears throat> I think that the theme that came out in 
both the publications as well as in the assembly itself. Uh, particularly, Danny gave Danny Olinger, the moderator, uh, gave a devotional on, I believe it was Saturday afternoon, when he uh, gave the Christian Ed uh, yeah. presentation, um, and and talked about the the OPC as as the Church of the Broken Heart. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, just to unpack that a little bit, um, you know, the 75th anniversary of of the OPC, there was a lot of celebration. Uh, there was a lot of joy. Um, it, it was a peaceful and uh, joyous occasion, uh, but it wasn't self-congratulatory, um, which I Far appreciate from, it. Yeah. Um, it and with the theme of the Church of the Broken Heart um, was accenting the fact that um, uh, that that the Church of Christ, not just the OPC, but the Church of Christ, is God's people who have been, by the power of the graciousness of the Holy Spirit um, in Christ, uh, uh, giving us, as it were, um, through conviction of sin, a humble uh, and a humbling and a heart, uh, one that has uh, realized one sin and one that has gone uh, by faith alone to Jesus Christ for, for complete salvation. Um, so uh, that in conjunction with uh, numerous citations of Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to you be the glory, um, that 75 years uh, in, in the OPC is a celebration of God's grace to his people um, in redeeming them through the blood of Christ. So um, that that was, you know, I mean, there's much more could be said and and Daryl was there, so he can you know uh, uh, supplement that or correct it, whatever. But um, that that's what I came away with um, from the seventy fifth anniversary celebration. Yeah, but Daryl, what was your take? You were there. No, for most, I, I would much agree. I, I wasn't there in all the sessions because I didn't have to be, and I had actually a lot of work to get done. But um, I think Jim summed it up well. I, I guess I wonder too if there wasn't a measure of um, surprise. And thankfulness, uh, because the last time the OPC had one of these uh, bigger events, bigger anniversaries, was 1986, the 50th anniversary, when the OPC had to vote on J&R, joining and receiving with P- with pres- PCA, and not to get into any kind of trash talk about the PCA, but I do think that the, both communions have gone in different directions, and I think... Um, the PC, the OPC is is largely um, more or less content with with uh, with now with JNR having uh, been rejected. So yeah. anyway, yeah, that 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 came out. Yeah, that was clear. Yeah, yeah, I would agree from the the, the portions that I was present. Uh, now, Daryl, you're no stranger uh, to writing about history, especially American Presbyterianism. We love having you on the program uh, just to speak about all these different issues. We have uh, a trusted source we can go to for all these things. Uh, but would you um, – well, I should mention to the reader and the listener that uh, Daryl has co-written a book with John Meather entitled Seeking a Better Country, uh, 300 Years of American Presbyterianism. Um, and that would lay a general foundation, at least an American foundation, for understanding what Between the Times is attempting to explain. And there's another book that we'll mention in a moment. But, um, Daryl, how would you see um, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church fitting into the broader context of 300 years of mm-hmm. this American Presbyterian experiment? Um, well, the, the 300 years begins with the PCUSA. So, mm-hmm. And there has been um, debate within the Orthodox Presbyterian Church about how much we really are the spiritual successor to the PCUSA. That was clearly the rhetoric um, and the argument in the early years of the, of the OPC um, when they were claiming to be the, the true Presbyterian Church as opposed to the PCUSA, which they believed had, had apostatized. Um, so anyway, the, the history of the OPC is very much bound up with the development of mainline Presbyterianism, or the, yeah. or the mainstream church, the, the PCUSA, as it's now known, it's it, that has gone through different names. Um, but it, it's it's um, also the OPC more or less bears the imprint of old school Presbyterianism and Princeton Seminary because of Machen's position at Princeton, um, because 
many of the early leaders in the OPC, John Murray, Cornelius Van Til, Ned Stonehouse, Paul Woolley were trained at Princeton. And Princeton uh, was one of the last uh, holdouts for the, at least in the Northern Church, for old school Presbyterianism, which was a church that broke with the new school in 1837 over the issues of Calvinism and federal theology as well as Presbyterian church polity. And the old, old school was trying to affirm the older conservative historic versions of those, those doctrines and teachings, mm-hmm. the new school being a little bit more innovative and a little bit more Americanized. So the OPC, in some ways, represents, I would argue, the old school after a hi- hiatus of about, well, almost 70 years between the reunion of the old school and new school in 1869, and then the, the OPC finally comes along in 1936. And that period, the reason, part of the reason for the OPC's smallness is because during that period, a lot of old school convictions and sympathies and people died. Mm. Or, so the, the OPC has never, I don't think, has never entirely thought of itself as old school and we're trying to recover old school Presbyterianism. I think they've pretty much, or we have pretty much lived it. Mm-hmm. But there's also been, because of the Dutch presence, um, because old school Presbyterianism was also associated with the South and the OPC originally was much more of a right, northern, northern church. Yeah. So that's another reason why old school doesn't necessarily fall off the, the tips of people's tongues in the OPC. Yeah. But I do think that would be the fairest place to put, of the predecessors to the OPC, to put the OPC there. Yeah. In, uh, in a few moments, I'd like to get into the issue of... Uh old and new side, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, don't want to jump the gun on that uh, too quickly. Um, 300 Years of American Presbyterianism, the, the book Seeking a Better Country, one that you should read if uh, you're Presbyterian or interested in Reformed theology, just a very helpful overview of uh, many of the events in Presbyterian history, and, and perhaps the strongest or the most interesting is uh, the analysis of the trends and movements uh, leading up to and then immediately following the Civil War. So it's a it was a very interesting and 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 uh, difficult time for Presbyterians um as the civil magistrate and its issues started to bleed into um some of our ecclesiological views and and then uh parsing all that out helps to helps us to better understand where the reformed church and where the presbyterian church is today especially in America. So I would uh commend that book uh, to all of our listeners and uh, we have uh, an episode on that subject in the in the archives which i hope to put into the show notes now there's another book or two other books we should probably speak about before getting into today's volume between the times um let's start with fighting the good fight which is another book that you co-authored with john mm-hmm. Ether. what were its goals and aims and uh, where was the opc at the time in which it was commissioned 1995 correct Right. Or it, that it was published. Right. John and I started that around 1993. Um, and the OPC was uh, coming up on its 60th, so that was part of the reason for it. No. Yeah, that would be right, about yeah. the 60th anniversary. Um, and there, and I explained this in uh, Between the Times, that in 1972 there was an overture from the Presbyterian of New Jersey. Yeah, for comprehensive right. history. Right. And... And the um, I won't go into details. It's covered in one of the chapters. It's actually it may be my favorite chapter in the book. The the way the OPC actually was able to recover her history um, and and the different manifestations and iterations of the committee for the historian or the or the historian or the historians. Um, but when Charlie became historian in roughly 1980, Charlie Dennison, excuse me. Um, to whom the book is ded- dedicated his mm-hmm. memory, um, he has still had this mandate to try to produce a history. So he was he got together with John and me and asked us to write. And it's the subtitle of Fighting the Good Fight is a brief history, and it really is yeah. a brief history. So in that sense, fighting was um, didn't still honor the, the, the overture. original overture for a. Con- and I'm not. I'm not necessarily comfortable saying that Between the Times is comprehensive, but it does get into more, right. m- much more detail than, than fighting did. For instance, in manuscript, most of my chapters in Between the Times were between 25 and 30 pages in manuscript. Fighting 
we were generally 15 to 18 pages mm -hmm. in manuscript. And, mm -hmm. and there's the same number of chapters in this book as in fighting. So it's almost twice as long. Mm -hmm. And we tried to cover the entire... Well, we didn't really cover uh, the breadth of, of uh, OP history in that book. We were looking at the founding period again and how important that was. And then uh, sections on missions, sections on ecumenic ecumenicity. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, it was dispute, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. It, was, it was both um, uh, historical and thematic mm -hmm. in, in our treatment of historical topics. So, um, so again, this is an... This is an effort to try to fill in the gap that's yeah. been in the telling of the o OPC. Sister. Now, back at uh, in 1986, there was the OPC's 50th anniversary, and two volumes were uh, published in in tandem with that anniversary. Uh, the first was Pressing Toward the Mark, which is a collection of essays that adds a number of excellent contributions from uh, a number of different theologians. But could you tell us about the other and uh, how uh, Between the Times uh, takes up and continues both where that volume and Fighting the Good well, Fight. The other it, volume you're, you're thinking of... It's like a coffee table right. book of some sort. I, I, I think that's just the OP Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 1936-1986. Yeah. And that's actually... It tries to list all the congregations, has pictures of all the congregations at the time. It's a really kind of a, a useful reference work as yeah. well, just to sort of see where and who was in the church at that point. And um, what they were wearing. <laughs> so some good pictures of George well, Cotton in right. there. That, you know, was, that's night, that, uh, that period <laughs> is pretty much an extension of the 70s. So <laughs> as the graphics to that book would also show... Um, but there really wasn't much of a historical treatment of the right. OPC in, in either of the books produced for the 50th. And one of the things I'm, I'm reflecting on after, after General Assembly is, does anybody produce more books about itself than the OPC? I you mean, know, exactly. I mean, you don't find the, the PCA or other denominations, to my knowledge, commissioning books about themselves. Although I, the, we were talking earlier before the show, yeah. and I, there are, I'm, do, I'm starting to gear up to do a chapter on Thomas Chalmers and the Free Church. And um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of history of of the free church and books by free church, by free people, church people about mm -hmm. the free church. But even so, I mean we're only seventy five years and we have all these books. But <laughs> yeah. I mean I think I, you could say that 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 means we overestimate ourselves, but it also could mean that we regard in, as the the church is important, the institutional yeah. church, and so trying to figure out what has made this communion tick has been yeah. important. We're trying to be self-conscious, uh, self-consciously Presbyterian and Orthodox Presbyterian, understanding our past and understanding where we currently are and hopefully have a, a biblical understanding of where to go. Right. And um, understanding and, and learning from our mistakes and also the places that we were, were good on, the things that we did well at, is uh, is critical. That's just that's what the function of history is supposed to be. Right. Um, a lesson yeah, and, a, and a teaching. Uh, Jim, any any other comments on some of these or the OPC and its uh, publishing tendencies or uh, on any of these prior books? Yeah, no, I I think <clears throat> a couple of things are are, are in order to ask. Um, yeah. Uh, Daryl, at this point, uh, and I have I guess two questions that are kind of related. Um, but they're not the same. So let, let me begin. I think the more pressing question is um, why history? Um, and, and I think that in our General Assembly, this, is, this came out. Uh, Crud. Hold on, everyone. This happened earlier. This is the Westminster Internet Connection. Choosing to fail at inopportune moments, it's calling him back. Um, Jimbo, would he? I won't. I'll let the tech, technical people take care of it. It's it, yeah. Skype's reconnecting him. He'll he'll get connected again. What is history? When he asked that question, I. I, I Visualize him wearing a beret, maybe smoking a cigar in a French cafe or something. <laughs> what? Hello. Is hey, there you are. You were just. Uh, could you repeat the question? The Westminster Internet decided to fail. 
You were, uh, you, the where, question was, what is history? Well, and also you were saying that at the assembly, that question, this question yeah. was coming up, and that's about where you cut off. <laughs> okay, all right. No, that's good. I, it, yeah, that's right. And so... Well, go ahead and repeat uh, the whole thing. It'd be, yeah, it'd make I mean, my at, life at, at our general assembly, it, it was coming up. This, this was coming out. Why does the OPC... Um, reflect so much on its on its history and uh it, it might look like e- egocentricity um so could you could you give us daryl um some so, something to reflect on in terms of of why this is so important for the opc to to be doing these history to keep its history to um uh, continue to tell its history um, for the future and, and for the present, not just so that we can kind of be people who dwell nostalgically on, yeah. on the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, immediate answer, historical answer, is that in 72, when the Presbytery of New Jersey overtured the assembly for a comprehensive history, it was in the context of a merger... Uh, discussions with the RPCES, the Reformed Presbyterian Church Evangelical Synod. And the Reformed Evang- – the RPCES was um, made up of, of two groups. They had merged uh, back in the 50s or 60s. I can't recall exactly. But the, the bigger part of that merger in the RPCES were Bible Presbyterians, Bible Presbyterians having split from the OPC in, in 1937. Yeah led by Carl McIntyre and, and J. Oliver Buswell. So the 72 overture then was in that context of merger, and ba- specifically whether the issues of 37 and the split with the Bible Presbyterians were still pressing or not, and whether, if they were, what that might mean about merging with the RPCES. Um, so people were looking to the past then to try to figure out this particular controversy, mm. and their their links to that um, past and whether that past was still binding. Um, and so the more general answer to the question is why the history of the OPC is is important. And this would be true for any communion or even institution, yeah. which is um, to, to, to see how you've gotten here. Um, I, I brought this up in the pre-assembly talk. How did we get here? Uh, oftentimes, People come into a church, a lot of new people come into the OPC constantly, new ministers, new congregations, and and don't really um, know what's going on. There's a conversation that has been going on in the OPC for 75 years now. That conversation has in some ways been recorded in minutes of the General Assembly and other places. And a historical account is a way for giving those people some awareness of that conversation and how to get access to it and be able to, to speak within it. I, I think that's one of the things that history does the best is to uh, recover and introduce people to a conversation that's already going on and, and also then to help them be properly polite. Mm-hmm. Often, as you know, if you're having a conversation with someone and someone else comes to the conversation and just starts to butt in, <laughs> and talk, that's not, a, that's not necessarily a good thing. So it's useful for people to sort of get up to speed of what the, where the conversation has gone, what points have been brought up, and then, this, then they can enter more meaningfully into the conversation. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the things that history does particularly well. And in the case of the OPC, where we've had so many controversies, opportunities for people to leave, opportunities for the OPC itself to vote itself out of existence a couple of times in merger discussions, um, again, it's very useful for people to have this frame of reference in one little volume to get some handle on that past. Yeah, sure. So, so the the issue of uh, of identity is very much yes. at issue here as yeah. we begin to talk and, about history. And, and and this is a theoretical question. I think that people could answer different ways as far as the the relationship of history to identity is is. I mean. If you go too far with this, you get into a notion of tradition defining the church, and the tradition can never be violated. And, of course, that's what Protestants oppose going back to the Reformation. So on, so that, in some ways, makes Protestants suspicious of history because they don't want to be bound by the past in that way and have their identity shaped entirely by the past. But on the other hand, to be to so emphasize Scripture, for instance, or, or contemporary um, understanding of scripture through through the spirit and and to neglect the past 
is uh, to do a disservice, I think, to what it means to be Orthodox Presbyterian. I mean, the, the word Presbyterian is in Scripture, but it also has, has a history. And, and so many of the words that we use have histories, whether it be theological terms, whatever. Yeah. So, you know, if people in the OPC are using Presbyterian in a particular way, and that they, we do use it in a way that's different from the way the Scots use the word Presbyterian or the way the Irish use Presbyterian. And then there are all these Reformed Protestants on the continent who don't use the word Presbyterian. They use the word Reformed. Yep. Um, so history is, again, a, a way of... Uh, at least being aware of these different usages um, and the ways in which these words have been shaped over time, that doesn't mean they can't, we can't revise the, the way that we use these words or point out that we've been using them mistakenly. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. But again, history is a part of that process. Yeah, and I think right. um, the first chapter here is very interesting. Uh, Orthodox Presbyterianism in an age of conformity. We spoke about the conversation and getting people up to speed, and in many ways you do that early on in the book. So don't feel as if uh, you purchase this book or pick it up from somewhere and you want to read it that you absolutely have to read the other books first. It would be helpful. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Hart does begin the book by bringing the reader up to 1945 which is uh, where this book begins. He briefly rehearses the major events leading up to the founding of the Independent Board of Foreign Missions, uh, Machen's trial, and the founding of the OPC, and uh, as well as the battles that the church fought and the stance that its leaders took in those early years. And uh, many of those battles and those stances would come uh, to be very significant through many other events later on in its life. Um, But one thing I wanted to draw out is, is implicit in the title, and you br- you bring this out in the book, Doctor Hart, the uh, the eschatology of it all. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, I know you you know some people will criticize you for or would say that you're not not big on Voss and whatnot. But here I must say you're bringing out some of the major themes. No, here. I I think I, I actually <laughs> think I am. But yeah, as well as right, the secular right. faith and, uh, and, right. and others that you you try to draw out some of these themes. But it's very interesting how this book integrates on millennialism into its uh, contextual analysis. Um, After Machen passed away and the Bible Presbyterian split off in 1937, it it became very apparent that the OPC was going to have to understand who it was and define itself. And the remaining figures were overwhelmingly amillennial. We think of uh, of, uh, Van Til. um, Machen had passed either that time or or just right right around there. Murray, Murray, Stonehouse. Stonehouse, all those others. And in this view, the church here, in the amillennial view, the church exists in an overlap of ages between a tension between this earthly world and the heavenly inheritance secured and inaugurated by Christ. Can you speak to that issue, the eschatology that's inherent, and uh, could you speak about your intent in the title and uh, in drawing out that tension and how it might have or how it does have things to say about the OPC's identity? Well, the um, less theoretical, less eschatological reason for the title is simply to um, this this in-between period, this, yeah. this middle period of the, of the OPC that, that I, along with the historian John Meather and the committee, believed had been understudied. Exactly. And I also probably should give a shout-out to... Um, William R. Hutchinson, who is never, no longer living, but a professor with whom I studied at Harvard Divinity School, wrote a book, I think in between the t- – or edited a book in between the times. So anyway, uh, it's playing around with that perhaps a little bit. Um, but the eschatological idea is that uh, the OPC has um, been frustrating to evangelicals, obviously to liberals, um, but – and maybe even to – theonomist to a certain extent because the, the temptation has been to either overly realize at the eschatology and immunitize the kingdom in some way yeah. um, and therefore the social gospel side of things right. is an extreme there and I think theonomists yeah. maybe long for that in yeah. some way the other side is to the other error is to fall off the other side and say that this world doesn't matter at all and the church doesn't matter we have a recent example of that in in in, in um, Harold, Harold Camping and yeah. Judgment Day, May two thousand one, uh, two thousand eleven. So, the OPC has walked this delicate balance, I think, largely informed by this eschatological vision, even though it hasn't necessarily been self conscious about it. That's one of the interesting things about the OPC that 
for all of her awareness, self-awareness through these books and things, she usually does things only with an inherent awareness of, Some of sort what of an she's doing. Instinct, do. you might say. Yeah, or something. I mean, yeah. part of it's because she really does act through her agencies and the collective bodies and it's hard to have one person making a decision when you have to get all the commissioners or at least half half the commissioners to agree with it um so anyway the opc because i think of this amillennial understanding of redemptive history has been frustrating to both to at least two camps within conservative protestantism has had to walk this this balance or this this um and and so you know that I think has shaped her identity, and may account in part for her um, her size or her smallness. Um, that's always I think that's a, that's another important thing that came up with the general general yeah. assembly too was why are we so small? I think people are at this <laughs> assembly are more comfortable with admitting we're small. That's who we are. Um, but um, but I do think that amillennialism is is a is an acquired taste. It's hard for people to understand that. When we should mention this is not in the sta- in our standards at all. Right. But 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 it's overwhelmingly present. Right. In the in the people and uh, in embedded. And I think it's imp- implicit in some ways in the standards too. I mean, it's it certainly I think is it brings out uh, crucial aspects of the standards, perhaps yeah. better than the other positions yeah. may. Yeah, that's a good point. No, sure. th- this is fantastic. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I was just going to um, ask a question, uh, if I could, um, and it, it's we're, we're backtracking just slightly, but and I don't know, Daryl, if you looked into this, and um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but um, I, I guess I will. Um, do you know what who it was that was the impetus behind the overture from the Presbytery of New Jersey in 1972? Because I, I think Charlie was in in that presbytery back then what was it him who kind of pushed the overture to the general assembly do you know um according to who was it who told me this i well maybe I, it's better that i don't say it but um <laughs> no the person i think who's responsible for it was davis young the son of ej young who at the time mm. was an elder in a church op work in new jersey um and it, what's it, partly interesting about that for me is that Davis, longtime professor at, of geology at Calvin College, now retired, living in in Arizona, I believe. Um, so he would be the brother-in-law of, of Dick Gaffin, Gaffin right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. He's he's working on a biography of his father, E.J. Young, wow. which I think oh. is really important because Young was um, a very impressive man and did a lot of work behind the scenes, but in some ways has not received as much acknowledgement of his his uh, work and, and and intelligence as, you know, Van Til and Murray. And, and I'm not trying to take away from them, but Young was a very formidable yeah. figure. Right. And um, so I'm, I'm glad that Davis is, is working on that. But anyway, that's someone at the assembly, I can't remember who actually, uh, um, told me that hmm. yeah interesting i it's kind of cool that my own presbytery was, was gonna say you're finding some that, pride you know? <laughs> pride in that at, <laughs> yeah <it's> a, <laughs> in new jersey always interesting things going on in the presbytery of new jersey right always interesting <laughs> always entertaining if not edifying that's right yeah yeah well daryl you're right here that the church was able to main quote to maintain a reformed witness that attempted to preserve the best of old princeton and that branch of american presbyterianism and to combine it with the insights of Reformed tradition outside of America. In what sense is the OPC through its history not purely American? Um, well, you see that you see it most evidently in ecumenical relations. Mm-hmm. The or English, I should say too. Yeah, but the church has, and again, this has a lot to do with the Dutch presence. Uh, Ned Stonehouse was the the ringleader, so to speak, of the OPC's ecumenicity endeavors. And the OPC was one of the first American communions, along with the C- Christian Reformed Church, to be in the Reformed Ecumenical Synod, which was a Dutch international ecumenical ver- uh, body that included primarily 
uh, reformed churches from the Netherlands and South Africa it started in the late 40s after World War II. So the OPC went headlong into that um, with the CRC and was conversing with these non-American reformed bodies. But also you see it by by being a place for where John Murray or the, some of the Dutch Calvinists, some Irish Presbyterians to this day are in, are um, – ministers in our church, um, some Canadians as well. Yeah. So the OPC has tried to do a more generic kind of reform Protestantism that recognizes the reformedness of other yeah. communions and not identify it with American norms. It's probably that a good thing that we were sued early on right. and had to change our name as a result. No, exactly. That yeah. was a, yes. I mean, the OPC's original name was Presbyterian Church, I always get it mixed up. In or of? I think it would think it was uh, of America. I think it was of because the the current PCA is yeah. in. Is that right. right? That's right. Right. So it would be mm-hmm. of. Is that a subjective or an objective <laughs> genitive? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's been a long time. America's since I agree. Presbyterian Church, or you know, or the, right? Or the, you know, anyway. But so they they went through a variety of names right. and came up with Orthodox. Orthodox Presbyterian Church. There's some funny Church. ones in there. I don't I don't recall if it's in fighting the good fight. It might be. The uh, the uh, I think so. The list of potential right. alternatives. Uh, um, one thing we did early on, uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church did uh, that falls within this time frame of 1945 to 1990 is uh, develop the Trinity Hymnal, which mm-hmm. uh, my church still uses the original, the blue the blue hymnal. Um, there's been a revised version, I believe it was revised in 1990 in conjunction right. with the Presbyterian Church in America which is affectionately called the red hymnal. However, you can sometimes find the blue hymnal in red and maybe even green. So uh, can't strictly go by color. What is the significance of a hymnal? And uh, what were some of the issues with the available hymnals uh, at, at the time? And right. Why did the OP come out with its own? Well, on the one hand, it was a remarkable accomplishment for a church so small that was small and poor. And poor. <laughs> by the 1960s, the OPC was doing somewhat better. The th- the 40s and early 50s were a real struggle. Um, but uh, part of the reason why the Trinity Hymnal actually did as well, the church had to take loans out to, to produce the Trinity Hymnal, but they, they quickly uh, recovered those funds because it sold well, not simply to other Reformed churches or Orthodox Presbyterian churches, but also I think in the evangelical world there was a, a sense of a need for a hymnal. So the Presbyterian hymnals at that point, there had the, the last hymnal that the uh, Orthodox Presbyterians would have used had they been in the original PCUSA was a 1933 hymnal that was probably the, the, the worst of all the hymnals the PCUSA <laughs> put together. One, one in indication of that is that they arranged the hymns in that hymnal by alphabetically, yeah. not topically or yeah. or... So... That's one way you can arrange them, but that's why you can have an index that <laughs> that arranges them alph- alph- alphabetically. Um, but Machen wrote a pretty extensive review of that hymnal yeah. and critiqued it. So the OPC, uh, there was another f- 1955, the Southern Church put out a hymnal that was better in some ways, but still not up to the standards. It had some stinkers in it. So the OPC <laughs> went ahead on its own and tried to produce a hymnal. I mean, conceivably, they could have tried to use the um, the Psalter hymnal of the Christian Reformed Church, but the you know before 1950, congregations in the CRC still would have been worshiping in Dutch, some of them, wow. and so using Dutch hymnals. Um, so the OPC needed a hymnal, and um, an important part of the OPC's hymnal or producing the Trinity hymnal was debating whether exclusive psalmody or hymnody was the way to go. And, and Mr. Murray ha- had a strong um, position on exclusive psalmody. His views were, were uh, represented, um, at least at the assembly level, with objections to the hymnal. Um, and on the other side, E.J. Young was a big proponent of hymns, and he served on the committee and gave a redemptive historical argument for uh, the importance of hymns. Personally, I still would prefer to sing psalms. I think they're generally superior to hymns but i think that hymnal was a was a good one and um and again it was it was uh 
maybe the first time the OPC could sort of pull off something collectively that made a difference. Yeah. Um, but aside from a lot of smaller, low-level efforts, pamphlet literature, Christian education right. material, or whatever. But th- this was a pretty significant contribution for a, a small church. I think it also demonstrates the significance of a hymnal, in, not only theologically, but also pedagogically. And uh, what the words that we sing as a congregation has significant impact, not only on our worship, but also on how we are instructed, what we take home, um, the teaching that 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 bears with us right. uh, day in and day out, also in private and public worship. Um, so it's it's very significant that the OPC would take it upon itself when finding no suitable alternative to say this is a matter that is very important. Um, we're going to take and uh, develop this on our own. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's a wonderful testimony to that generation, and there's a, an amazing amount of work and also sacrifice that went into developing the hymnal, which still sticks around today um, and uh, is, is used uh, in many, many congregations. Um, the next chapter, um, we don't have to go through each one seriatim, but uh, I think it's a significant chapter belonging to the OPC uh, in this chapter, uh, Daryl describes the formation of the form of government, the book of discipline, and the directory for public worship. Uh, what is the significance about all – we read about all these different debates of should the pastor belong to the presbytery or the local church? Um, you know, what do we require people to, to – uh, what, what's in the vows and oaths that we take uh, when we become members – what is the significance of uh, all the things that are spoken of here in this chapter? Well, I think part of it is, wh- what does it mean to be a member? Yeah. I mean, not just a member of a church. In some ways, w- Americans... Or the Boy Scouts. Right. Or, <laughs> or, the, the, United, or the United States. <laughs> yes. Or, I mean, people belong to a lot of organizations. Right. Um, and n- 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 I would argue none of them have the claims, though, that people... Uh, that the, the church has when you look at the membership vows. Mm-hmm. And and um, if you take those vows seriously, so there are some really significant theological realities being affirmed there. Um, so that was part of the reason for... It was, it was important in the church to try to get a sense of what are the, going to be the limits of our membership and the rules by which we govern ourselves. I mean, that's important for any church... And it was interesting for me, at least as a historian, to see how much the OPC drew upon the existing materials from the PCUSA or not. Um, and they did a fair amount, actually. They, they used the, the form of government from the PCUSA as a guide in, in, in many respects. But as you, as you alluded to, Camden, um, at, at roughly the same time, the OPC wrote study committee reports on belonging, whether churches should include a Boy Scouts troop. Yeah. And also whether Orthodox Presbyterians could belong to the Masons. Yeah. So the point there being that if you're going to join the OPC, there may be limits to what you can, other organizations to which you can belong. We don't tend to think of the church having that kind of restriction on us. Um, And I think probably many Orthodox Presbyterians to this day don't necessarily think through, well, I'm a member of the, this congregation, the OPC. What does that mean for my involvement in some other organization? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oftentimes there's no, there's no problem at all. Um, but in some cases there were. In the Masons, it was always the case in many Reformed churches that that was a denial of um, some of the membership vows in the churches. And then the Boy Scouts was also an interesting question, too, because there was a lot of civil religion attached to the, to the Boy Scouts, a high regard for God, but not enough that the OPC would say we should we should uh, some measure of tolerance this. that was required of, of troop masters and, and right. those sorts of things. So we end up with some um, conflicts uh, that need to go on there. Uh, Jim's going to have to hard out uh, in a few minutes. We'll continue the discussion, but Jim, before you get moving, uh, I wanted to allow you to ask any questions um, before you have to get going. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Camden. Um, well, I, I, if I could just ask about the um, uh, the chapter uh, chapter six is on Westminster Se- uh, Westminster yeah, Seminary exactly. and the OPC, the first generation, mm-hmm. and um, you know I, I'm 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 curious it, because you also have another chapter uh, chapter eleven on the uncertainty of Westminster Seminary. So could could you 
perhaps um, uh, trace out your line of thinking over those years about how the OPC and, and Westminster Sem- Seminary interacted and related yeah. and um, where did it go? What's the basic storyline that you tell? Right. This is often misunderstood, too, and uh, I've heard people recount some of this history incorrectly, so it's mm-hmm. helpful to have this here. Um, one, of the, one of my challenges in, in writing this book was I didn't have the time and I wouldn't have the space really to give a lot of attention to individual congregations and individual presbyteries, which I still think needs to be done, as if we need more history of the OPC, but still. <laughs> I want to read that history of the Presbytery of New Jersey. Um, you know. So I wanted to try to tell the story through the institutions of the OPC. The one institution, obviously, the OPC has is the General Assembly. That's, a, that's the body where everyone in some ways gets a voice. Obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a delegated assembly, so it doesn't admit everyone, but still. So I could look at the actions, reports of the General Assembly, and try to make some um, headway that way. But also in, important for the OPC were two parachurch organizations in a way, one of them being the Presbyterian Guardian. There's a chapter on that in the book. A very important magazine for the for the OPC, where people could express a number of controversial ideas and arguments, um, and 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 have debates about them. It, it was it was a very good publication, and it's a great thing now that it's online, up and yeah. available at the OPC website. Yeah. Um, but then Westminster Seminary was the other very important organization or institution related to the OPC. The OPC debated whether or not to make Westminster a denominational seminary in the 1940s. They decided not to. Um, but that first generation, was it was, not, it was unthinkable for them, I think, to think of ministry in the United States apart from the OPC. They all served incredible number of hours, incredible number of committees yeah. for the OPC. And so that prevailed really until that first generation either died or retired, somewhere in the mid-'60s. And then the the next generation at Westminster, for whatever reasons, um, and I try to explain what some of them may be, was it was let it saw itself less um, identifiably identifiably with the OPC. Yeah, um, yeah. And what was what's interesting about that is you could say, okay, well, the PCA came along and that's what changed Westminster, but it was actually Orthodox Presbyterian faculty at Westminster that that made some of the biggest noise that gave Orthodox Presbyterians themselves pause about Westminster. So that would be people like uh, Jack Miller and the New Life Mm -hmm. Movement. That would be Harvey Kahn, who was a very strong voice for Orthodox Presbyterians in the 1950s and 60s as a missionary, both home and foreign. Mm -hmm. But then when he started to develop his his ideas of missions in connection with anthropology and contextualization— That became a problem. Norman Shepard controversy is another part. Shepard himself very much identified with the OPC, but his views on justification obviously were controversial in in many circles. And Ed Clowney himself, um, the president of Westminster, was an ecumenical visionary in many ways, and he wanted to see Westminster pursue a bigger uh, piece of the pie than the OPC. And so he he was responsible for trying to move the OPC, clo- I mean, the Westminster closer to the PCA. Um, so anyway, you could look at Orthodox Presbyterian faculty at Westminster itself who um, maybe got tired of the church and in turn the church became a little doubtful about Westminster. Yeah. And um, speaking of, uh, let's, let's uh, op- open up and speak about the, the shepherd issue and some of its uh, connection to the OPC. Because there's a lot of interesting items going on in this thing. We've got JNR, which comes later, uh, right? Uh, you know, after the controversy had been running for a while. But we also have issues of the relationship between the seminary and one of its employees and his writings, uh, and also the Presbytery of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. He's a member of the Presbytery. What were some of the um, oddities or tensions um, in this relationship that happened in the mid '70s and early '80s? Well, I'll give I'll, one example of of an incredible anomaly. It seems is that uh, um, President Clowney um, was hoping to keep 
Great Commission, to back up, Great Commission Publications, which was the Christian education publishing endeavor of the OPC, mm -hmm. early on received buy-in from the PCA in 1975. And so it looked like the OPC and the PCA were going to merge in some way. J&R became the mechanism for that eventually in the 80s. But, and Clowney had been very much important to, to Great Commission and originally, and I, he was very much behind Great Commission being a PCA, OPC endeavor. And in 1979, there was a meeting, the denominational meetings of all the Napark churches took place in Grand Rapids at Calvin College. Another kind of summit meeting that looked like more mergers Movement. were coming mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and many expressions of a common cause among these churches. Um, but, but the shepherd controversy was the, the wrench in the works. And it was one of the reasons why the PCA did not want to merge with the OPC in the early 1980s. And once that happened, Clowney was willing to take more action in regard to Shepard than he yeah. had been. He, he had been willing to try to work along, and there was a, div there was a split vote both on the faculty and, and in the Presbytery, so Clowney wasn't going to intervene. But once J&R &J failed the first time with, with the OPC, and he saw that Shepard was an important reason for it, then he was much more willing to study it and give a report and take, me take measures to yeah. relieve Shepard of his duties. So, you know, so that... If if J and R isn't happening at that point, I'm not sure that Norman Shepard would have lost his job at the seminary yeah. when he did. And we should say he was he was charged, but uh, Shepard was never found guilty. Right. It was a draw vote, was it not, in the Presbytery of Philadelphia? Right. right. And there was also a, a split. You you mentioned on the faculty at Westminster, he was never found guilty of any charges of right. any sort, but yet lost his job. Later and it on. wasn't until the board finally. I mean, the board finally had a majority vote yeah. against. So that to was the only them. body that really um, ever voted Did anything. Yeah. against Shepard. Well, um, it's an interesting uh, history uh, there. It really is. The relationship between Westminster and the OPC. Um, why stop at 1990? I'm sure there are many good reasons for that. But uh, to let the listeners know, why does the history stop uh, in the year right. 1990? Well... <laughs> It's because, for me personally, um, anything within 20 years, you can't you evaluate historically. You, you don't have – it's, it's journalistic impressions at that point, it seems yeah. to me. Uh, that might seem ar artificial, uh, just say a 20-year cutoff. Yeah. But, but you also are writing about um, – I mean, I'm writing about a lot of living people now, as yeah. it is in the book. But when you come up even close to the present, you're writing about even more. Right. And all those people have different ideas and opinions about what transpired as well. Um, so that's, that's mainly the reason. It's just to, you know, it's a, it is a period of transition. I do think that there is also, though, aside from the historical objections, there is a by 1990, the OPC had moved from this period when it had grown tired of fighting, whether it be liberalism or for the Reformed faith, when um, there were a number of uh, efforts to try to move the church in a more evangelical direction. Um, those efforts had finally pretty much um, hadn't been stopped entirely, but the the momentum had shifted in a different direction, and it, and it happened by 1990. I think it's fairly responsible to say that. So yeah. that's another reason for that that mark. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. And the historical distance thing, uh, it's it's not necessarily arbitrary. It's very important to have, right. to have that. And uh, 20 years to 25 years seems to be a pro about the appropriate amount of time. Um, in our in our remaining moments, uh, there's two significant. Um, issues and trends I'd like to, to address. And while we're on the topic of Westminster, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, at, at the risk of uh, transgressing this, uh, this uh, historical distance precedent we've set, it, it, it's interesting to me um, the, re the seeming resurgence of the OPC on the campus here at Westminster Theological Seminary. We have recent ordinations of Lane Tipton, mm -hmm. Carl Truman, uh, John Curry, who's a minister in the OPC, is now working full-time. 
Um, there is still a majority, I believe, of PCA involvement in administration and on the faculty, mm-hmm. yet the OPC in the last five years has made uh, kind of a bounce back, I guess is one way to speak of it, at Westminster. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts on that, and as well as what the future might hold for uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian right. Church and seminaries in general? Uh it's been such a long time since I've spent time on campus. Um, so it's it's hard to tell what that might mean for Westminster um, mm-hmm. going forward. Um, it would... Um, I, I think what it might mean for the OPC, at least, is that for, the, for a kind of... Um, conservative reformed um education or conservative reformed scholars yeah you may you may find more of them in the opc than you would in other communions um doesn't mean that we have more scholars than anybody else but it uh scholars of a certain kind of conviction perhaps yeah, yeah. and it's self-selecting it's not like the opc I, carl didn't, Carl didn't grow up in the OPC. It's not like the right. OPC cultivated him. John right. Curry didn't grow up in the OPC. Right. Lane didn't. But so there's something well, self-selecting yeah. that people I end up identifying with the OPC, to, myself included. And so, you know, those those are the sorts of scholars that maybe an institution like Westminster is going to look for in order or to— Or other groups. We find a significant amount of OPC right. people at Westminster Seminary, California— uh, John Meathers at RTS, although I, I don't know if the percentage of OPC people at RTS is as high as it is here or, or California. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Minninger, now professor of New Testament at Mid-America Reform Seminary. Alan Strange. Right. Um, I, I, I Forgive me if I'm forgetting some names, but we, we are finding um, OPC people in teaching positions at a number of, uh, of uh, Reformed uh, seminaries. Hey, we could, have, we could start our own. <laughs> Yeah, the denominational. Uh, we just need to come up with some more money, right? Yeah. Well, but um, <laughs> perhaps it is the self-selecting thing. Yeah, uh, and, and that's an interesting way to put it. Um, but you know, I'm in the OPC, self-selected. I guess of all the people I've named, I don't know if any of them grew up in the OPC except Marcus. Right. But um, I mean, I think still the issue is is the degree to which um, seminaries and seminary faculty are going to be churchmen and and I mean if it and here the Westminster original Westminster faculty are incredible but they yeah. they invested so much in the life not you know they weren't simply going to presbytery meetings they were showing up at general assembly yeah. all the time writing yeah. serving on all sorts of committees that were meeting four times a year or whatever right. um so it's it's that kind of work I think that um Will be very useful to seminaries, to, for students especially, to to appreciate the the life and ministry of a communion and to serve within it, and and not simply be independent pastors who happen to go to presbytery. Right. And sometimes they get called upon to go to general assembly, but and it doesn't mean you have to to bleed OPC, you know, <laughs> green or blue. I guess our color is blue, but you, you know, but to see that your work as a pastor is connected to th- this visible unity of this body. Right. It reminds me of Meether's uh, subtitle for the Van Til bio, you know, Reformed Apologist and Churchman. Right. And we do find many churchmen uh, in the OPC and, uh, and those who have also served as seminaries. Right. Um, Jeff Waddington, our good friend, uh, wrote a really quick uh, response to this book, Between the Times, on the website feedingonchrist.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jeff's not here to defend himself, so we'll speak, uh, at, you know, at liber at liberty <laughs> about some of his comments. Jeff, of course, uh, I, uh, studying Jonathan Edwards, and uh, he's in the historical milieu of uh, the Great Awakening. But the one minor criticism Jeff had of the book was that some of your old side tendencies come out. Right? Would you mind for the audience, uh, the listeners, explaining the old side, new side, and just broad brushstrokes? And then we can start to ask the question about the old side identity of the OPC. Is there such a thing, or or should right. that be such a thing? Um, well, the old side and new side split was over the First Great Awakening. Yeah. The old side 
um, was particularly, um, if it were defined by anything, it would be defined first by subscription. They were they were leading for subscription to the Westminster Standards, and it was their group that sort of helped get the Adopting Act off the ground in 1729. But then they were also um, defenders of Presbyterian polity, and they saw that the revivalists of the First Great Awakening were violating Presbyterian polity pretty much left and right. I think I really think that's fair to say. Um, and so the, the, the new side was pro-revival. Um, and there's a sense in which they were Presbyterian second, revivalist first. Yeah. And the old yeah. side was Presbyterian first, and then if, if they were going to have revivals, it would have to fit in with old side convictions. So the OPC is more old school than old side. I think it's fair it's almost possible to say that the old side was overwhelmingly anti revival and that even the good revival I mean Second Great Awakening is a bad revival. <laughs> First Great Awakening is a good revival because it's Calvinistic. But um the old side was even opposed to that good revival because of all the um the breaches of Presbyterian polity and decor, et cetera. Um and the OPC, I don't think, has ever really thought of itself in, in those terms as yeah. anti-revival. Right. I think the, the old school of the, of the 1830s was more or less pro-revival, anti-Finney, but pro-revival with subscription and, um, and church polity yeah. or, the, or Calvinism of, of, of the standards. So I think the, it's still fair to say the OPC is closer to the old school than to the old side, even though Certainly. the old side's convictions are very much alive and, and I think pretty well in the OPC. It's just a question of on the revival issue. Um, so I'd be curious. I wish Jeff were here because I'd actually like to yeah. know what where those indications were <laughs> of an old side because I didn't think – in, in thinking about the book, I didn't think um, revivalism necessarily came up, or even too much yeah. evangelicalism. So, no, um, perhaps, um, perhaps in the union, the union okay. of ecclesiastical bodies and some other things, he might be thinking of. We right, can, we can ask him. Perhaps sure. we'll do a reform media review on the subject. Right. Um, but overall, I thought I thought the treatment in the book was very even handed, and uh, again, um, done very well. So Jeff was very. Very appreciative. No, I, I, yeah. I don't mind I know, criticism. I That's fine. <laughs> of course, I'm not suggesting you don't. Um, where does the OPC go um, on into the future? And, and in another 25 years, in, 19, in 2036, when we have the 100th, uh, if the Lord doesn't return, and prayerfully if the OPC still exists at the time, um, what what do you think might be written at at, at that venture? Um, is it too dangerous to say, or, or where is the church leading, and what are some of the yeah. trajectories for the next twenty five years? <clears throat> well, my on the basis of what I see going on now, and I, I <clears throat> and I can see this going on for a while. It is um, that uh, there are believers in America who um, are getting tired of the fads whether it's from the mega churches or celebrity pastors or or whatever and they they want a simple sort of church well boy have you got simple with the OPC but <laughs> um but they're willing to sort of give up size give up razzle dazzle and have something um that can uh, it's a tough sell to go into a congregation on a on a sunday morning that's only 30 to 30 40 people, people. yeah yeah. When you are even a hundred people makes you feel anonymous compared to that. Yeah. Um, so I'm not saying that this is there are pen, tons of people just flocking to the OPC, but there are some people who have just gotten tired of um, the shenanigans that are going on in church life and are looking for solid exposition of the word. And they are going to find that they're going to find serious worship in the OPC. We have many differences over worship in the OPC. But I still think that, generally speaking, we're, people are serious about worship and serious I- about conducting it in an appropriate way. So if, that, if the other trends persist as far as the megachurch phenomenon, the entertainment, the whatever tricks are used, at, I, I think they're tricks, to, to, to attract people or to start new churches, 
the OPC may have a niche. Mm. I mean, I, that's not to say that those churches don't exist. There aren't people in the PCA who are like that as well. They are. But visibly, that's not what the PCA is known for, at least in its more visible expressions. Um, so anyway, I think that could be the future of the OPC. And and um, to, to provide a life raft, in effect, for um, people who just get burnt out. Yeah, it's from, interesting from to other, see. And that doesn't mean we don't do evangelism. We do try to do evangelism. <laughs> we don't just steal sheep, but... <laughs> But I mean, but they're self-selected sheep, <laughs> right? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it, and it's good, uh, but to understand the trends and the recent uh, uh, movements, we think of organizations like uh, Together for the Gospel or the Gospel Coalition, and uh, this resurgence of a of a broad evangelical Calvinistic type theology. I, I'm curious to see what happens in five or ten years. Um, especially with the effect of media uh, upon the church and uh, and the younger people in the church, we think of all the all the influence that Ligonier has had in the last thirty years through videos, and mm-hmm. perhaps that's a big factor in in causing some of this recent mm-hmm. uh, interest in in Calvinism. Maybe Ligonier's uh, impact is starting to catch up with the evangelical church in the next uh, ten, twenty, thirty years. I wonder what will happen with all of the current resources right. that are being presented. Yeah, I mean, I guess one of one of the trends of this this young restless reformed, or one of the consequences of it is I don't see a lot of attention to the church per se, or, yeah, or to worship ecclesiology, per se. right? And there's that old side, those old side convictions that are significantly right. lacking. But maybe that comes in ten, twenty years. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, we we're, what are we at now? Uh, a broad discussion of the doctrines of grace. Right, and in ten, twenty, thirty years, maybe, maybe we'll start to get into ecclesiology. We can only hope and pray that that would be the case. Right. Uh, so hopefully, uh, there'll be another volume written in a hundred years that talks about uh, revival in in a in an OPC old side sense, right. a revival of ecclesiology and a revival of uh, old school convictions. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I it, I hope this wasn't too much of an insider discussion. I, I think it has significance for. Reformed and Presbyterians of all stripes, um, our little denomination, the OPC, which is, I believe, just shy of 30,000 members, or just thereabout, um, has a lot to say, I think, for um, the church at large, and it's an interesting history, and uh, one that is still going strong. So thanks for writing the book, Daryl, and thanks for joining us today. Sure, it was great. Uh, We can uh, point you to the websites of... um, interest uh you're first going to want to check out oldlife.org which is where daryl is is writes uh consistently and has uh, many interesting topics there including uh discussions of opc memorabilia <laughs> recent but if you want to see uh you know old school and old side uh convictions in practice as as daryl analyzes and discusses various trends uh seriously and in jest sometimes you can visit oldlife.org and you'll always be uh um, sharpened, uh, entertained at sometimes, but uh, you'll you'll definitely learn as you read uh, the information on the website. You can visit us online at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about all of our programs, uh, Christ the Center, the Reformed Media Review, uh, Historia Ecclesia, all sorts of resources available uh, free of charge at reformedforum.org, and you can visit us at reformedforum.tv for information about all of our live broadcasts. I want to thank everybody for listening. And we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.